Good right. afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hola. Uh, my name is Maria Victoria Abreu. I work here in Global Foundation for Democracy and Development, GFDD, um, as an international affairs and socioeconomic program manager. And today we have the honor to have uh, Ms. Aniel Conlois and Manuel Orozco from the Inter-American Dialogue to talk about, to discuss a topic that is very interesting. It's brain drain. high skill immigration is willingness to leave a country linked with its government performance. We have talked about brain drain for years, but I don't remember reading anything about its relationship with uh, uh, its government, the, con the, the country that it's uh, of origin, um, the, the bribes and, and corruption linked to, to, to why people are emigrating necessarily. I mean, you, you read about people trying to, to find a new, a new life, better job opportunities, family ties. But the government performance, it's very specific, and I find it really interesting. So today, uh, Aniette will present us her research on that topic um, for the Master of Public Policy in Georgetown University. And then we'll have Mr. Orozco um, discussing and commenting on that topic. And we can also have a Q&A uh, session afterwards. I'm sorry. OK, so Aniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria Victoria. Well, I will stand up because I love to stand up. And uh, first of all, I would like to speak uh, briefly in Spanish for those, if there's anyone in the room who doesn't speak English. Esta presentación yo la voy a hacer en inglés. No obstante, si hay alguien que no entiende algo de lo que yo dije, en inglés, yo con mucho gusto, tan pronto finalice el panel, eh, me, me encantada, me sentaré a explicarle cualquier item que necesite más información. Eh, now I'll switch to English. So, my name is Aniette Conlois. I'm an MPP candidate from Georgetown University, hopefully graduating this Thursday. And um, I would like to thank Mr. Manuel Orozco for taking some time off. Uh, I do appreciate that because I know how busy he is and how busy it can be as well to be in Washington, D.C. at this time of the year. Also, I would like to thank <coughs> Maria Victoria Costa for all her support and also for welcoming here, uh, welcoming me uh, to the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Also, even though he's not here, to former president of the Dominican Republic, Dr. Leonel Fernandez Reina, who has also also welcomed this type of topics to be discussed at such institutions like this one. And finally, I would like to thank my family who is here, my mother and my sister, mm -hmm. who came from the Dominican Republic and who are supporting me here. This is very valuable. Diplomats from the Embassy of the Dominican Republic, friends and colleagues from different scenarios, from multilateral banks, and Dominicans who also reside here in the area. So thank you very much for being here. And with this, I'll be introducing the topic that I'll be talking about today, which is high school immigration. So I'll start my topic by talking about Natalia. Natalia is a lady from Argentina, a country in Latin America, and she came to the US to pursue a graduate degree. After she completed her degree here in the US, she remained here, she uh, worked here, and also she met Mateo. Mateo is, uh, was a colleague at her job, who is from, originally from Mexico, they fell in love, they now have a family, and they live here in the US. Both of them came from countries that I'll call origin countries, they came from developing countries, they pursue some sort of territory education, and they used to this tertiary education as a tool to get access to better opportunities abroad. Whether it was like to secure uh, a better income because of safety concerns, it could have been because of many different reasons. And they are foreign born nationals in the country where they reside, which for the purpose of this example is going to be the United States. I became interested in understanding a bit better what could have motivated Natalia and Mateo to remain abroad, but also to leave from their home countries. I know that they wanted to pursue <coughs> higher education abroad, but what could have been part of the immigration formula that they used to think about to leave in their home country? And I thought about government performance. In order to do this, 
I first got interested in the topic, which is commonly known as brain drain, but the official name used to it is high school immigration. And the issue is that origin countries, the countries where these immigrants originally come from, they lose talent that could be used at home. While destination countries, and for this example, countries such as the US, European Union, etc., gain highly skilled human capital. My research question was, could there be any relationship between high skill immigration and poor government performance? And why I came up with this question? Because there has been a lot of literature already addressing labor market constraints. We know that sometimes people are not well paid off. And I control for this. And the model that I designed, with the information that I had, of course, people are concerned about being unemployed as well. It could have been also because there's no jobs at home for the skills that they have, etc. But I was wondering, what about the government? And in order to do this, I developed a hypothesis, which you can be here, you can see here. But basically, I was interested in seeing, in finding out if a highly skilled individual's willingness to leave a country could be correlated with the government performance. And in order to test for government performance, I thought about bribes. Okay, let's use bribes because bribes is a way, is a clientelistic transaction to get access to some sort of, of public service. The public services that I'm using here uh, are interactions with the police to get access to education, health services, gas, electricity, and I think that's it. I developed this model, which I'll be happy to uh, express later on in further detail. And I tested it by using the following data and methodology. So basically, for those that are familiar with these types of concepts, I first ran a NOLS, an ordinary least square regression, a logit and a multi-level model. I did this following uh, research that I'm using, supporting my model, developed by Hiski et al. and Dalton. Basically, Dalton uses a multi-level model in his research uh, using micro-level data and macro-level data. And the multi-level model test at individual and at a country level. The logic model, I'm using a logic model because my main dependent variable, which is basically, I'm using information from the Latino Barometer Survey of 2016. And there's a question that asks respondents, if you have ever seriously considered to go to live abroad. And this um, question ends up being a dummy dependent variable. By this I mean that the person ends up responding yes or no. And because of this, I am running a logic model. As I previously said, I'm using information from the Latino Barometer Survey, and I'm also using a macro level variable from the World Bank governance indicators, specifically testing for government effectiveness of a country. In my study, I'm using the Dominican Republic as the country of reference. It is the only country in the Caribbean that is included. And also, I'm using the Dominican Republic because of a specific reason that I will tell you in one minute. Uh, the sample used in the study is approximately 20,000 people within the age range of 18 to 65 years old. And I divided these people into skilled and unskilled. And in order to, div to divide them uh, into skilled and unskilled, I use criteria that have been used previously in the research, which is if the person has completed some sort of tertiary education. So if the respondent had completed university by the time of the survey, I put them as skilled. And those who had not completed university by the time of the survey, or who had not pursued any type of university by the type of the survey were uh, categorized as unskilled. And this is the reason why I'm using the Dominican Republic as my country of reference. Here I developed this map uh, showing basically the amount of respondents in the region who admitted that they wanted to leave the country, that they were seriously considering the, uh, to leave their home <coughs> countries. I did this by using red to red to categorize the amount of people per country who responded that wanted to leave. And here I'm having both skilled and unskilled people in this map. As you can see here, the Dominican Republic is the darkest. It's a very small country here in the Caribbean, but it's the darkest, the one that has like, it's 
more highlighted in red. And basically what this shows is that was the country with the highest amount of respondents that responded that they were seriously considering leaving their home country. This marginally increased the more the socioeconomic status of the person increased as well, which is something that uh, caught my attention. Also, it is important to note the variation among different countries. You can see that countries that are way much bigger and have a uh, way much bigger population than the Dominican Republic are even had very lesser amounts of respondents who were seriously considering leaving their home countries, such as Argentina, as Panama, etc. Also here in this visualization, you can see that across Latin America, when we looked at the 18 countries that I'm using in my model, basically highly skilled people on average who admitted paying bribes and that they were considering to live to, they were highly skilled, they had um, paid bribes, not necessarily were considering to leave their home countries, except for a few countries, such as the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Honduras, El Salvador, Bolivia, and Colombia. It's important to note that here I'm using information from 2016. This could have marginally changed uh, during the last years. Nonetheless, this confirmed the, the interest that I had uh, using the Dominican Republic as a country of reference. And now let's look at my findings. So after running regressions, I ran quite a few regressions. And the first one, I used uh, the 18 countries in my model, first looking at everyone, so both at skilled and unskilled people. And here you can see the information for the OLS and the logic models. For the OLS, I ran a test for model diagnostics to test actually whether it was a good, it, it fitted my data. And I had to use robust standard errors for the OLS. And for the logic, the logic did fit it very well, my data. And it's interesting because when we look at the information that's showcased here, basically what it's saying is that for everyone, regardless of having been skilled or unskilled, on average, the people who had had some sort of interaction with having paid bribes, if they are concerned about becoming unemployed in the next year, if they have perceptions about not having enough funds to leave, if their socioeconomic status is a bit better off than those that are in the in the low, it, that are not very well off in the socioeconomic level, the more the skill level increases, having been victim of a crime, the younger they are, and the worse they think that the government effectiveness of their country is, the more the likelihood of wanting to leave the home country increases. And we can confirm this by looking at the results of the logic model where you can see that actually the, the results marginally increase when we look at the, at the logic model then, inferring that the likelihood of wanting to leave marginally increases. Now, looking at the highly skilled people across the 18 Latin American countries, there was something that caught my attention. I saw here that having paid a bribe was not necessarily statistically significant. So, uh, however, <coughs> perceiving that you didn't have enough funds to leave, being better off, having been victim of a crime, and believing that the government effectiveness of your country is poor, increases the likelihood of wanting to leave. This could lead to different assumptions, but one that caught my attention is because looking at the previous results, you can see that being skilled increases the likelihood of wanting to leave, but then I look at the skilled people and not necessarily having paid a bribe um, influences the decision of considering seriously to want to leave their home country. And I came to the conclusion that this could be because when highly skilled people are thinking about leaving their home country, on average, looking at the entire region, having paid a bribe doesn't necessarily make an impact in the immigration formula that they are um, developing in their heads. And this could be because they have the resources, they have the resources to, to actually pay bribes. It could be because they want to leave either way, or it could be also because there was something that's of higher impact, which could be having been victim of a crime. 
because it was very significant in the regression that I run. So then here, looking at the Dominican Republic, which is the country of reference, I want to note that in total for my sample, I had approximately 900 people of which, um, here I'm looking at everyone, it ended up being 863. Here I'm looking at skilled and unskilled people, and for skilled people I had approximately 60 people, which is something important to note because I didn't have too many in the sample that I was looking at. But when looking at the Dominican Republic, we can see for everyone, so regardless of being skilled or unskilled, having paid a bribe, being <coughs> concerned about becoming unemployed in the next year, perceiving that you don't have enough funds, and having been victim of a crime, and also being at a very young stage in your life, influence the likelihood of wanting to leave your home country. Then, when we look, please be welcome. When we look at the highly skilled people in the Dominican Republic specifically, actually having paid a bribe is still significant, and having been victim of a crime is also being very significant. So it influences also the likelihood of wanting to leave the home country, and when we see the logic model, it marginally increases. Finally, looking at the multi-level model here where I'm looking into individual, and individual level and country level, basically here we can see that for looking at everyone in the 18 countries and looking at the highly skilled in the 18 countries, what I got in both regressions was that having been victim of a crime increases the likelihood of wanting to leave your home country. For everyone, when we look at everyone regardless of your skill level, having paid a bribe is still very significant being concerned about unemployment and your perceptions on standard of living is very significant. Nonetheless, for highly skilled and skilled people, it's having been victim of a crime, which um, seems to make an impact in the, in the decision to the question that I'm looking at. So this is a bit out of my research, but I wanted also to see and compare, basically, because in my data, I don't have people who actually emigrated to the Dominican Republic or emigrated any of the 18 countries that I'm using. So I said, okay, but I want to see actually at the stock, as, as the stock of Dominican immigrants who live in the US and that are age, are older than 25 years old to see, like, let's just have a look. And I developed this visualization showing actually the trend of Dominican immigrants that have come to the United States from 1980 to 2010 and are older than 25 years old. And as we can see here, since the early 90s, at least the uh, share of immigrants who are in the US marginally increased, but also the gender gap widen a bit, as you can see. We can see here that uh, females uh, composed the largest, likely the biggest stock of immigrants, of Dominican immigrants who live in the U.S., followed by males, but it's important to note that also the stock of male migrants who live in the, in the U.S. have also um, gradually increased during the last two decades, as specifically of the highly skilled. This is not the same for different Latin American countries. Here I'm just using the Dominican Republic because it's my country of reference. So basically, in conclusion, my policy recommendations in my research are focused on the following. First, on addressing crime, because as shown in the data, crime still persists and still, and still is one of the main issues that drives people away, but also specifically highly skilled people. The second is corruption, because corruption interaction, but this is a, ve uh, a type of corruption that's usually at low level, so like to get access to basic public services, is still prevalent and is important in some cases, depending on the country that we're looking at. Something also that I noted out in my policy recommendations is the imbalance that still persists in Latin America between the market salaries versus the cost of living. So basically, Latin America is still today the most unequal region in the world. And even though we know this since many decades ago, the imbalance between what people earn versus what 
the cost of living is, is, is huge. And this then leads to what we call moonlighting or a pluriempleo, which is basically leads people to become consultants, so they have their jobs, but they become consultants, they have different types of jobs at night, they teach at universities, etc., to be able to cope with the cost of living. And finally, something that I noted in my policy recommendations were also to have a further look into return policy, return migration programs. So return migration programs have been a tool that have been used in many countries around the world, for example, Malaysia, China, Singapore, even many African countries have used some return migration policies. Uh, Africa had MIRA, which was targeted to reattract people to work in public service. And in Latin America as well, we have Programas Raices, a roots program in Argentina, which was targeted to reattract uh, people who worked in STEM, so science, technology, etc., math, who, to come back home. In Colombia, we have Colombia Nos Une, etc. So in, uh, I am interested in return migration programs too because I believe that this could be very useful to develop uh, policies that could retain or reattract people who have had access to opportunities to work back home in public service to actually t tackle some of the main issues that are linked with governance to improve the state of governance in their home countries. And this is because, as history has shown during many times, people who have had access to the best types of opportunities, including education, have made changes in the world and in their home countries. And the U.S. is one example of this. So if we want to retain and reattract those that have had access to the best types of opportunities and the best type of education, we have to focus on them, <coughs> develop policies for them, and then hopefully have Natalia and Mateo to come back home uh -huh. for support uh -huh. their home countries. Thank you. Thank you, Anit. I think that was really good, really interesting and eye-opening. Um, now we are going to hear what the expert in migration, <laughs> remittances, and development has to say. Dr. Manuel Orozco, it's a, it's a long time uh, expert and friend of the foundation. He works at the Inter-American Dialogue, and you have some things to say, I believe. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be here. The, the last time I was about was about ten years ago in Santo Domingo mm -hmm. at, the, at the foundation. <laughs> yeah. The DR I, I go quite often, but mm -hmm. uh, it's always a pleasure to be in <coughs> Santo Domingo. Is anyone speaks uh, English <coughs> only? One person. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, well, let me uh, first of all congratulate you for your graduation because. <laughs> Um, it's really an accomplishment, and coming from Georgetown University, it's a second very valuable accomplishment. Georgetown is in the top five um, universities in the world in international uh, relations studies. So um, it's really a, a quite a, a proud uh, to to graduate from their being from the diaspora. Um, also, congratulations on the report. I think your, your thesis is quite insightful. Um, it brings up a number of issues that are really relevant today uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that the, the trend of uh, labor mobility, international labor mobility, has grown significantly since the post-international uh, global recession of 2009. And for Latin America and the Caribbean, one of the most important realities that we are looking at is that this uh, labor mobility is actually connected to what we call the state fragility. More and more people are migrating from countries that are highly um, unstable, politically challenged. Uh, countries like Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, um, the Northern Triangle countries from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, even Colombia and Nicaragua. Um, in fact, 40% of migration is, is coming from those eight countries. So looking at the relationship between migration <coughs> and uh, governance is a really important issue. 
Um, so I congratulations for looking at this issue from an angle that is actually quite uh, contemporary and relevant. Um, I have a, I'm going to make a few comments uh, uh, on the paper um, in, in, a, in the context of the, the academic nature of it, but also the, the policy aspects of it I within the framework of what we talked um, on the issues of state fragility and international migration. Um, I think, um, you know, from, from an academic perspective, pers precision is really important. Um, and I think uh, the paper should benefit more from uh, precising the theoretical framework and the conceptual frameworks relating to brain drain, to skills, and to uh, clientelism. Um, and by the way, I'm a political scientist by training, mm -hmm. but for the past 20 years, I also, I, most of my work is in developing economics and particularly in, in finance and migration. So mm -hmm. I have sort of this combination of stuff and clientelism is really one of the issues. I, I, I actually learned the first time I visited the Dominican Republic. Um, I trained myself on these issues, but I, the, of all the countries I visited all over the world, uh, in, in more than a hundred places, the Dominican Republic still exhibit one of the most salient practices of clientelism. And I'll, I'll sort of <laughs> explain a little bit of that, but that's how the elections work in the DR even today. Um, but in any case, uh, I think the, the, the term and the, the, the terminology brain drain is actually relatively obsolete. And I think we need to move away from it because um, what it entails in technical terms, brain drain is a condition by which the net balance of your labor force in certain skills is negative because of out migration. Mm -hmm. So take for example nurses. Um, uh, nurses are individuals who are relatively in the high skill segment um, who have received an education and a specialized training to complete complex tasks and are paid relatively well. Um, now, in some countries, for example, Jamaica, it is known that there is a large outflow of Jamaicans coming to work in the United States as nurses, and there is the allegation that there is brain drain. When you actually look at the demand side and the supply side of the labor force with regards to nurses, actually there is not a net negative net element. If there were, then you could argue that there is a brain drain. Um, so uh, this is really important because it leads to a lot of uh, opinions and misperceptions as to what, it, what impact those migration has on the exiting of people of different skill categories. This is really essential because it, it may lead then to negative uh, implications that it's wrong to migrate because you have skills. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really important, especially today in the age of globalization, um, and we'll, we'll talk later on this, when in fact the three metrics of competitiveness in the global economy are labor portability, labor flexibility, and labor connectivity. So those who are more competitive, better off are people who are basically more competitive. But those who are more competitive are people <coughs> who have uh, flexible skills, who have portable skills, and who are connected. So. Um, if you say that brain drain is bad, then um, you know competitiveness is not good. But you know it's actually not the case. Mm -hmm. So the second one is um, skills. Skills is really a particular type of um, segment of your workforce that applies to people who actually are able to complete complex tasks. And these complex tasks are measured in terms of the training, the education, and even the pay scale in which they are. And, and so education alone, tertiary education, is not a, a very, uh, it's, n it's an incomplete indicator of what skilled population means. For example, um, and with all due respect, I'm now a political scientist, I'm not necessarily skilled on, in the complex task of political analysis, <laughs> unless you know you do game theory, for example, and then specialize on certain particular tweak points of behavior economics. But you can be a political scientist who, who graduates uh, just in comparative politics, and that doesn't make you a skilled individual, even if you graduate with a PhD. 
So um, <laughs> this is really important because if you're going to make your analytical tests, then you're going to find some precision issues. And then comes clientelism. Clientelism, uh, using bribes as clientelism is not an adequate proxy because clientelism is a peculiar political practice performed by political bosses uh, to exercise favors, typically economic favors, in return of loyalty for political payoffs. The important uh, feature of clientelism uh, is patronage. There is a patron-client relationship. So in Dominicana, for example, eh, el PLD tiene una red amplia de operadores políticos en todo el país que se encargan básicamente de ejecutar un trabajo de conectarse con el partido directamente desde la base hasta arriba. A cambio, yo le voy a dar un puesto en el Banco Central. That was my first um, experience. The first time I went to the Dominican Republic was to have a meeting with the, the head of the Central Bank. That was in 1998. And I go there, and first there is the reception. There is a lady who was from the PRD. The lady in the reception makes a phone call. Dr. Orozco is here, and he's coming to meet with so-and-so. Okay, so <coughs> there comes the concierge. The concierge takes me to the elevator. At the elevator, there is another person inside pushing the bottom of the floor. That's three people. You get off the elevator, and then there is another person greeting you at the door of the fourth floor where the central bank director is <coughs> to open the door and say, who are you coming to see? I'm coming to see Mr. So-and-so. Ah, muy bien. Okay, pásele. And you go to the secretary, that's five people. There, is a th there are seven people that you have to go through to meet uh, a person of authority. And even today, I promise you, you go to Santo Domingo, go to a government agency, and you're going to go to at least four people. That's clientelism. Uh, it's not bribing. Bribing is a practice that is performed by anyone to just ease a transaction. But it's not necessarily uh, a, a byproduct of clientelism. However, it is, a use, it, it is a important to look at the issue of bribery. Uh, in the broader sense, because it, it seems that it has increased in the modern times. Um, the, the other <coughs> point I wanted to make is that um, when you look at this issue of the high-skilled intention to migrate, I think it will have been useful to measure actually the variable um, integrating uh, people with high skills and the intention to migrate into one because that allows you to really capture that observation alone and see what are the patterns. Uh, because the models as they are, they are capturing in general the intention to migrate vis-a-vis -vis the skilled individuals. But actually when you look at the specific group and how they correlate to certain trends, you're going to find interesting <coughs> stuff. Uh, we just concluded a study in the Northern Triangle. The Northern Triangle are Los países de Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. These are the countries that are like really bad when it comes to homicides. Tienen 13 homicidios diarios. Hmm. Then the, la, la tasa de extorsión es de 10,000 extorsiones al año. And they extort you for 200 bucks a month. But the guy that extorts makes salaries that are typically twice the minimum wage. So, you know, it's a good business. Gang members, etc. This is a phenomenon that the Dominican Republic ha didn't have to deal with until about five years ago. When, um, with the war on drugs that occurs in Mexico, has a spillover effects in the Northern Triangle, and it pushes certain of the, uh, the, the drug trafficking routes to the Caribbean, to the Dominican Republic. And all of a sudden, many of the... Uh, of the, the, uh, of the uh, the Dominican Republic is faced with an increased crime wave. Mm -hmm. And now you have uh, different organized crime networks quite <coughs> operational in the DR that they were not before. Mm -hmm. But it's um, just to give you an idea, uh, the United States consumes, one and a half million people consume about 500 tons of cocaine every year. 
do the math, I'll leave you to do the math how many grams of cocaine each individual takes, but that 500 tons of cocaine equal to about $30 billion. It's a profitable business, but it causes a lot of deaths in the region. So in this study, we actually look at the intention to migrate, and we found that being a victim of crime correlates with the intention mm -hmm. to migrate by, by a lot. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea, I mean, the statistical measure is uh, that there is a 100% uh, chance, probability, that if you've been victimized, like robbed, you're likely to emigrate mm -hmm. to, your, to the United States, mostly. So... If it's nearby. Mm -hmm. And I we actually found that if you... Um, it depends <coughs> on the country, but if you are skilled, you're more likely to migrate in some countries like Honduras than in other countries like El Salvador. But that has to do more with the fact that in a country like Honduras, which is poorer, um, you see the poor doesn't migrate. This is a really important issue. The poor cannot migrate because it costs to migrate. Mm -hmm. uh, financially, it costs at least $7,000, at least, because that's what it will take you to cross the border irregularly. Plus, the first two months of staying, it takes six weeks to get a job in the U.S. as an irregular migrant. Um, so um, the poor doesn't migrate. But in a country like Honduras, for example, you, you are faced with um, the fact that those who have certain skills are going to be the ones who will be able to afford to emigrate. And they are not really enjoying being there because they are not getting paid. And on top of that, they're getting you know, close to killed. Um, so so the, the issue of, of um, the measurement really will benefit the, the paper because it's worth really producing this thesis into a publishable piece. Um, and then my, my other recommendation is the, the policy recommendations do need a lot of masticar. Okay. Uh, because um, <laughs> the, you, know, you talk about safety, etc., but every country is different. You know, the challenges of insecurity in Brazil, which influence some Brazilians to migrate, are very different to the challenges of a Honduran or a Dominican to migrate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, police reform is not enough. We know that police reform you know, can improve, but yet there are certain things, for example, if you're dealing with drug trafficking networks, police reform doesn't go very far. But if you improve uh, intelligence gathering on how these narco trafficking networks, going back again to, to cocaine trafficking, of the 800, there are 800 tons of cocaine produced, manufactured in South America, 500 tons come to the US, 300 go to Europe and other parts of the world. Now, there are no more than 50 drug cartels handling these operations. Now, divide $30 billion by 50, and how filthy rich this guy gets. Mm -hmm. Because the cartels are not operations that have more than 100 people in their payroll. So intelligence gathering <coughs> matters because you have, you have to tackle not only drug interdiction, but money laundering and counterfeiting. So, it, 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 so that, that's, and the issue of living standards, totally, I agree with you. Now, you have to refine again those issues specifically on what about living standards. What we have learned is that um, there is a threshold of income that allows people to stay in their home country and not opt out. Um, and that threshold, typically in Central America and the Caribbean, is having an income somewhere around $500 a month. Um, so the, the issue is that in countries like the Dominican Republic, uh, most of the Caribbean and um, Central America, uh, actually in most of Latin America, our labor force is informal. That is, it's unskilled, it's uneducated, and it's underpaid. And that informality is really one of the major challenges of economic development. The reason being that the model of economic development in Latin America and the Caribbean follows a very skewed system. It's basically based, uh, consisting of uh, a few economic activities, agricultural exports, maquila exports, tourism, government expenditure, which is in the DR it can be as high as 20% of GDP. I mean, two out of $10 are spent by the government. 
uh, that's you know it's, it's you need to have your yeah. clients you know active so th that explains some of the government mm -hmm. expenditure but um, those four economic activities plus migration which is an important reality in especially in Central America and the Caribbean represent nearly 60 percent of GDP five economic activities that you count with the fingers of your hand is almost two-thirds of the national income of most of these countries. I mean, Haiti is the extreme case. 35% of GDP is coming along from remittances. The Dominican Republic is 10%. Um, but tourism is, is, the DR is highly dependent. The problem with those economic activities is that they are relatively like enclaves. They don't have forward and backward uh, value chains mm -hmm. where you can generate more value. You know, tourism doesn't generate a lot of value, mm -hmm. except the rent that um, the government receives from co charging taxes on real estate. Um, so, so, so the, I think, uh, and finally, just uh, I think it might is really important to explore alternative methods to to ex to analyze this subject from different perspectives. One is to reconceptualizing the skilled uh, issue, and particularly, I do encourage you to move away from the the brain drain terminology. Um, of course, I'm picking a fight. I've been doing working with colleagues on brain drain issues for the past 20 years, and it doesn't take you anywhere. Uh, but also look at the literature, particularly the most recent literature on economic development and um, on globalization. Uh, for example, MIT's and Harvard uh, uh, University have developed this index of economic complexity. It's one of the most refined perspectives of economic development that tells you that a country's way to uh, be more competitive and to ge that generates more wealth are the ones that develop the most comple com complex tasks. So, for example, to design a fountain pen may seem to be an easy thing, but actually it takes a lot of technology, a lot of uh, brain, because there is a lot of design involved in the preparation of this, and the raw materials that need to be transformed. The same thing goes with the cell phone. You know, it takes a lot of uh, knowledge to produce such a complex device. So uh, now the, the theory of economic complexity is perhaps one of the most important tools right now that help you to understand how development can actually be achieved. It's, it's far more uh, valuable than even the sustainable development goals that are more normative uh, than actually indicators of economic prosperity. And then you have you know, the literature on globalization, particularly one, one sociologist that I think has one of the most fascinating approaches. And in it, when you think carefully, it takes you to economic complexity, is Sigmund Bauman, who talks about the, that we live in the age of liquidity, meaning that in this day and age, the speed at which things go is so fast that by the time you try to complete one thing, a new you have to start shit comes out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the typical example is the damn cell phone. <laughs> you, you save money to buy, you know, the latest cell phone, but the latest cell phone is no longer the latest piece because there is a new cell phone coming out. And it costs 500 bucks more than what you paid. And it's like, it, it, it is causing a lot of anxiety on the society. Mm -hmm. And that anxiety actually leads to insecurity. But in any case, the, this literature on globalization is really important to integrate it within the context of migration. Because migration, human mobility today, is at the center of uh, the global economy. And so um, I think I'm, I'm going to stop here, but I think um, it's really uh, valuable to look at this type of research. And to I encourage you to continue working on it. And congratulations. I mean, I'm, uh, it's awesome. I used to teach at Georgetown. Yes, <laughs> I know. Great, great yeah. university. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Thank you so much for you. those words. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
so Mr. Orozco, because I know also you have to leave. I, I must admit, I have presented this uh, thesis at a few conferences, and I must admit that your feedback has been the most detailed and valuable, because I can see that you really put attention to it, and it's something that's deeply valuable to me, because it's, you know, it's like when you're researching and you see someone who's more experienced and give you very useful feedback, this is going to improve it way much more. Um, I would deeply appreciate if later on, perhaps, we could speak about your idea about um, merging or working with the skilled people and the dummy dependent variable that I have on considering to leave. I, I would like to explore that. <coughs> and then on the topic of brain injury, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that's why I am so keen on using the, the high, high skill and migration description. Nonetheless, brain drain is a very catchy one, which resonates a yeah. lot. But I do agree with you, for example, a lot of the literature even justifies how even remittances sometimes lead to brain gain when people actually leave the countries, how it balances unemployment at the home country, etc. I do agree on that. Nonetheless, I want to note again that I'm focusing on the government part because there has been a lot of very useful literature focusing on the labor market constraints um, around the topic. So thank you a lot for this. I have taken notes, but for sure I'll keep in touch as well <laughs> because I'll take your feedback into consideration. And hopefully one day soon we can actually publish yes. something yeah. Yeah. with well, the support of... To, yeah. to publish a, yeah. an article with you. That will be yes. great. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions, somebody? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, so I, I want to go back to the issue of mentalism, and uh, I would like to ask Mr. Orozco, oh, if you don't think that this is what we said in Spanish, un uh, mal necesario in such development country, uh, especially in certain stage of development. Look, I think clientelism as such is not wrong because it, it is a cultural practice that is used in many societies, mm -hmm. not unique to Latin America, but is, you know, it's a legacy of colonial rule mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. this patronage of relations. But you know, if you look at the literature, um, Marxist literature, Engels, for example, the master-slave um, uh, conundrum, you know, that you, you are a, you're, you're not a slave, without a master, you're not a master if you don't have a slave, etc. Um, the same thing applies with clientelism. The, 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 the challenging issue with clientelism is when it transgresses the rule of law. If clientelism transgresses the rule of law, then it's wrong. And what we have in, the, in our democracies is precisely that problem, that the political party system relies on clientelistic methods in order to subvert the existing political institutions that govern the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So for example, a political authority, a political boss, the, the president of the municipality, uses his political authority to continue staying in power and subvert the rule of law by committing fraud in an election. But because he's so powerful and he has promised favors to individuals in the locality, he can get away with it. Now, if this individual uses favors that, are, that don't go against the rule of law and losses and respect the laws, clientelism is fine. Mm -hmm. But that, that thin line actually was tested in several places. And in the Dominican Republic was tested um, after Balaguer dies. And you know, with the emergence of uh, Leonel Fernandez, for example, you had a, a new wave of politics in the <coughs> country and democratization that was quite fascinating. But then again, I mean, Lionel Fernandez reformed the constitution and created re-election and all those things that really didn't pay well in the end for the country in the long term. And uh, you know, this is a debate that, that historians are going to come and, and make him accountable for um, in the future. But so this is really a challenging, how do you reconcile political culture uh, of a society with democratic political culture. And we are really dealing with this issue today all over uh, Latin America, and we call it populism, mm -hmm. which is, you know, populism was dead apparently 
20 years ago, and now it's all back. If you were going to design a, a global career bridge, what would be your recommendation based, based on the data and the, or probably the rules that the world has established to migration, what would be the, the, the route to create that bridge? To make the knowledge flow and be flexible, affordable, you think that the, the rules are in place to make that happen? No, <laughs> no way. I mean, this is, the, there is a professor, um, I think she's retired, Saskia Sassen, who argues basically that we live in a world where we're confronted with two normative practices. One is sovereignty, um, and the other one is rights. Which one prevails? Everyone has the right for uh, freedom to move, you know, the four freedoms that you know, led, uh, were protected during the, the Second World War, freedom of religion, freedom of, mobili of, of expression, freedom to move, um, and freedom from fear. Well, we really don't have enforcements of those because the sovereign states decide who comes in and who goes out. The way to, one way to, in, to reconcile the two is strengthening more guest worker programs. They are challenging to many states, but they are challenging not to states, but politicians. Take Trump, for example. He has this anti-immigrant bash taking place right now because he thinks that we are just bad hombres. We are bad hombres because we are <coughs> brown, not because we are migrants. If we were all white-looking folks, he would be very happy with that individual. So, uh, and yet, for you know, I mentioned the Central American migration. It's in the news. It's, it's a foreign policy priority so much that it led to the creation, the enactment of a national emergency in the country. I mean, what's, that's fucked up with all due respect. Because um, 100,000 Central Americans come in, 600,000 trying to leave their countries. The, you, you use the variable of willingness to leave, 1.8 million Central Americans want to get out of their country. Of those 600,000 make the attempt, 100,000 make it. You can create a visa program, a labor program, to basically recruit 80,000 people and make the odds of making it for one in four. That will lead 500,000 people to compete for a visa program that will get 100,000. And you don't have to worry with a national emergency. So there are methods to deal with this. Uh, but, you know, sometimes politicians don't want to hear ideas because they just have one thing in their head. And right now, we are dealing with a, a nationalist or a neo-nationalist uh, emergence all over the world. Uh, I call it nativist sentiment. This sentiment that makes you feel that you feel threatened by globalization, so it's mm -hmm. making people really uh, reject the foreign. But in this day and age, what is foreign? I mean, everything you're wearing today is not made in the U.S. And you don't give a damn by that. And it was made by, by different <coughs> forces, etc. So, so we fool ourselves with a lot of things. So there is a method. In how many countries have the, the, your idea about the work guest visa? Well, the, we do have a, a guest worker visa in the United States. That's yeah. H2B and H21. Uh, we ha also have H1Bs. I mean, we have 45 different visa categories. And I mean, we have the NAFTA visa, which is only issued to 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, the, but the, the issue is not that, it's the political framework that is not <coughs> utilized by elites to make it happen. Because there is the belief that it's electoral politics in the middle that may challenge your opening to migration. Um, I just want to go a little bit back and ask, uh, continue the conversation about colonialism. Um, so you mentioned that for you, colonialism is not that bad because 
a lot of it comes from our ancestors, the way they did things, and how it um, innately, at least for the Dominican Republic, became part of their culture. But how would you, um, or would you consider that it currently, the way the government is developing the Dominican Republic, is there a negative impact financially and educationally um, due to clientelism, specifically in those positions where people who are acquiring those those titles don't have the skills and requirements for the positions that they are being, let's say, given? Yeah, look, clientelism, it's inadequate when, as I say, transgresses the rule of law. That is, when you, you abuse your authority to obtain favors. So if you don't abuse your authority, the clientelistic network, it works here in the United States. I mean, it's called networking. <laughs> I'm loving it. You know? <laughs> that, that's clientelism. Mm -hmm. You know someone, you know someone, and look, I need a favor. Can you help me find someone a job? Can you give them an interview? Yeah, sure. <laughs> There's nothing in return. But at some point, there will be something in return, you know? But you're not abusing your authority unless there is a conflict of interest and you don't respect that conflict of interest and continue with it. Mm -hmm. So when the state um, doesn't have the procedures to prevent or enforce confl conflict of interest, you do have a problem. And so in, in governments like the Dominican Republic, you may put a blind eye to conflicts of interest. For example, el ministro de Hacienda decide contratar a fulanito de tal que es el primo de mi hermano. Y no tenemos ninguna relación, pero es mi es el primo de mi hermano, yo le voy a dar un trabajo. So, you know, now, it, uh, or um, I hire someone and I hire them on a higher pay scale. All those abuses of authority are enforceable. There are institutions that allow you, but sometimes the bureaucracy struggles with these issues. Now, the silver lining to this, which I find fascinating, is that over the past 15 years, um, in the post-democratization age, uh, when these countries become more democratically consolidated, etc., bureaucrats have become, even in the Dominican Republic, more respectful of rules and procedures than clientelism. And we need to look at those bureaucrats and reward them with more authority so that they can actually enforce the rules and procedures more systematically. And that's the challenge. But the otherwise, you do fall into uh, the abuses of authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted <coughs> to ask you, I, I've read your work. I'm from Guyana, and I read about your work on Guyana. I was going to mention Guyana. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered whether uh, you've updated that, and how does it compare with the Dominican Republic? And then another quick question. If we are not using brain drain, what do we use now? And um, how would you look at the migration from Venezuela? How, how, what word do we use for that migration? If because I knew you were coming, I would have prepared <laughs> myself. You got me off guard. Um, the, the, you know, the Guyanese migration has continued. But it also has had um, a little bit of a slowdown. So I, I actually was looking at this uh, when we released our remittances reporting last April uh, to see how Guyana performed because there is a, a decline in remittances and that led me to think that there was a decline in migration. And there is a slowdown on migration, but it's not that significant. Uh, most Guyanese migration is actually not irregular, it's legal migration. And you can track it through uh, US visas, for example. Um, I hope I have a funny anecdote about the Guyana, uh, the, the minister, give it, give it. The, the minister <laughs> of migration. Of you, <laughs> no, no, he, this was, he told me, I, I went to interview him about 15 years ago and he tells me, uh, you know, those numbers of Guyanese migrants are not even, I was telling him, you know, my estimate is 7,000 Guyanese leave the country every year. Guyana at the time was 600,000 people. That's 1%. That's a lot of people getting out legally. And he says, there are 40,000 Guyanese leaving mm -hmm. the country every year. We call them backtrackers. And then he starts showing me the routes that they go through Curaçao, through Suriname, through Jamaica. And I put it in a report. 
and the minister, the, the prime minister reads the report, and he wanted to know who has said that, and he wanted him out. I got him out, then the guy went after me. It's like I couldn't go to, to Guyana for like they three months. Yeah, but um, I think the, the role of, of irregular migration to Venezuela uh, is not as substantive as it is in the other countries because of the boundary, the, the, the difficulties of crossing the border. Um, but it's likely to affect uh, Guyana like in the other countries. Uh, we just completed a, a four-country study of Venezuelan migration. And I mean, one of the major issues is uh, the, the labor force is more skilled, mm -hmm. far more skilled. They have not only uh, th over 30% have a tertiary education, but they also were working in occupations, which is an important variable to introduce as a skilled, as a metric of skill, <laughs> in occupations that were technical, that were not uh, related to law skills, like you know, entertainment, um, services, etc. Um, and I suspect that the same thing may be happening with Guyana, uh, but we have to look into it. We'll come and talk to you. Yes, I'll, I'll send you a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I did, I did my research and I did my <laughs> homework, so I'll send it to you. Okay, last yes, one. Hi. Yeah, it's a rather a comment. Um, you referred to your clients, listen, uh, it's when you transgress the rule of law. And from a legal perspective, I might agree with you, but I think there's more to it. And I link that problem, especially with the lack of development of the countries in Latin America, which Correct. is something common to all the countries in Latin America. Because when you have a government, huge government, that is giving more opportunity in terms of job placement, and the private se sector is lacking to give opportunity to their people, then you are confronted with that situation that, you know, you broke the rule of law, but also mm -hmm. the lack of development is really an issue. Uh, it, it play a major role uh, when it comes down to clientelism. Yes, you're so totally I think it's right. That thing that, from a legal perspective, the transgression of the rule of law, it might be a good uh, opposition, although some countries uh, has put in place different laws to try to avoid that. Yeah. From, from another perspective, the situation within the United States is different because it's true that you can go through networking and get opportunity for job placement everywhere, but there's a difference. In the United States, you have to be competitor. If you're not a competitor, then you, you're going to be probably uh, lacking that opportunity or not take advantage of the opportunity to get a good job. Although, uh, in, the, in, the, in an American country, you can find all kinds of individuals putting them for a job, getting a job without having no qualification for mm -hmm. it. And this is a very a huge problem and a big issue because then you have people in position that they're not capable to do the job. They don't have a clue how to do the job. They don't have the educational background even to back it up. So, you know, this is the difference that I see. Yes, it's true I, that, it's I true that you are networking, but here you have to be competitor. Otherwise, yes, you won't be able to put it You, you job. want a foot in the door. And that's the, the general idea of clientelism is to get a foot in the door. Uh, but, I mean, if we put it elegantly, we can say that the likelihood of people from Latin America to abuse clientelism is much higher than in other countries like those mm -hmm. of the United States. Um, but definitely you're right that a lot of the clientelistic practices are a byproduct of the problem of inequality, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was mentioning that you have five economic activities uh, in most of these countries, the rest of the labor, only 30% of the labor force works in those activities. The rest of the labor force doesn't fit in. And so they end up in the informal economy. Mm -hmm. So in order to operate, you rely on clientelistic relationships to survive. And it's definitely uh, a function of, uh, as you say, of development or the, the consolidation of the political and bureaucratic institutions. If the institutions are robust, they do replace clientelism. Because if you have the rules of the game that are respected, and enforced, you don't need to ask for a favor. You know, the, the, the asking of a favor is a, as in addition to, just in case. But you can only achieve that, that through development. I, exactly. So you do need to have a developed society, uh, but it becomes a chicken and egg issue, yeah. you know, at what point you yeah. do achieve development 
without the proper institutions. In my, in my opinion, if you achieve sustainable development for a generation or two, you are able to achieve that after a period of 40 years. It's not possible. before that. Because the people that are born during that period of time, they are raised and, and educated with a different type of mentality, which is also what it shifted from a third world country to a first world country, which is what happened in the United States and so part of Europe, like <coughs> France yeah, and yeah. Germany. But the problem is that if you don't give sustainable development in all the aspects of the process uh, 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 you know, of building a country, you won't be able to achieve that no matter what you do. Yeah, no, look, in, in academics, this is the headache of most uh, political scientists. Which one is worse? I have to refer oh. to so Jeremy Rick. We have yeah. to, uh, if it's really brief. I just brief. have a very okay. brief comment. <coughs> when we're talking about development, I, I, I agree to a certain extent, but I think that the, the myth in the room is that we haven't discussed or haven't really focused <coughs> in on is not so much development, but education. Mm-hmm. And education, in order for you to, com- to, to develop a competitive uh, base, you know, to, so that you'll be able to, to network and be able to, to access the job market that you need to, 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 to access, you have to have a good education um, so that you'll be able to, to get rid of some of the, the political favors that, that people depend on because they don't have access to, to good skilled jobs. Yes, uh, look, development is a condition by which a society is able to uh, achieve upward mobility, better quality of life, improve material circumstances, and make choices. Mm-hmm. That's what development is about. Now, how do you achieve that? You achieve that by investing in assets, physical, financial, and human assets. Human assets include human capital investment. Mm -hmm. Within human capital, you have education, but education alone is not going to develop a society. Mm -hmm. There is a correlation between education and and development. development. Let me, me actually, no. There is not that strong. Let me give you the example of Central Asian countries. The the former countries of the Soviet Union. These countries were societies where the, the Soviet Union invested heavily in education. You have people, I mean, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, you have people where 40% of your population have a tertiary education, 60%, no, 60% of the population has a tertiary education, and 40% have PhDs. And they are among among the least developed countries in the world. Mm -hmm. What about Cuba? What about it? Cuba, it's... Really don't go there because it has <laughs> one of the worst <laughs> education systems. We, we need to, to do another event. Yes. This just is to 1970s. Talk about that. In the 1970s, you could argue that Cuba's education levels were comparable to those of Costa Rica. 1980s, they were competing to stay there. After the 1990s, Cuban oh. education sucks. And I can tell you because I worked a lot on Cuba and I seen the education performance of Cubans, whose their grammar is the most remedial, remedial in the Americas. I mean, we we can be here all day yeah, long. Yeah. These are they, very they interesting like the the topics. topics. Yeah, so that is understandable. That is understandable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, awesome. Again, education, you need to have development. If you don't have yeah. development, you will have no quality, quality yeah. education. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Aniel. Congratulations. Yeah. And thank you, Mr. Rocco.